Good morning, everyone. Uh, we're going to talk about tables and charts and some other things this morning. Um, we're going to spend a little bit of time in the PowerPoint presentation, but most of our time we're going to spend in an Excel file. And uh, just to soothe everybody's mind, both the presentation and the Excel file, when we get finished with it, uh, I will upload and you can uh, you'll be able to download it from this this uh, team session. Uh, last time. We talked about navigating Excel and understanding how it stores dates, times and doing some simple formulas. Uh, this week we're going to look at look up options. Uh, we're going to look at some of the new spill functions in Microsoft 365. Uh, we're looking at data tables, pivot tables and charts. So let's talk about a table for just a minute. A table, they're a special format in Excel, which makes organizing and manipulating data easier. Uh, so a table consists of a header row with titles for each column, followed by data rows um, that relate to that header content. Uh, we can create a table anywhere. We click any site anywhere inside our table or our data and say format as table. Uh, and then a table, the hallmark of a table is the alternating shaded rows. Uh, you don't have to have them in a table. Uh, however, uh, this is a, it's a nice way to make sure your data is more readable. Um, note at the bottom, you can define your own table style. Um, I personally, if you look at these color choices in here, I tend to gravitate toward the blues or the greens and occasionally the grays. Um, blues or greens are usually pretty easy to read. The greens kind of harken back to, I, I don't know how old some of you people are, but the old mainframes had line printers and they had alternating green and white lines on the line printer so you could read it, so you could follow a line all the way across. And that's kind of where this idea came from. So the, when you format that as a table, you click anywhere in there, you click format as table and Excel will automatically collect what the active uh, data is in your worksheet. And it will automatically, if you click my table has headers, then it will automatically assume that the first row of your data are your headers. So if you look in here, this is just some uh, salary information. Uh, for a fictitious company, uh, higher date, last name, first name, salary. So when we clicked headers, we clicked my table that has headers. It assumes that those words across the top are the headers. And <coughs> it automatically expanded the selection to all the contiguous data. Uh, contiguous, you know, the ones that are connected to each other. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, if you look at the ribbon at the top of Excel, and we're going to go to Excel here very quickly, uh, normal ribbon kind of looks like the, the graphic at the top. But if you click inside a table, you're going to find another button on your ribbon, and it says design. And if you click on that design tab in your ribbon menu, you'll see that there's a lot of things there that you can do with your table. So, so first of all, let's say, why do we want a table? Well, number one, tables will automatically update if you add data at the bottom or to the right. They will automatically include that information in the table. So that's kind of nice if you're going to use ongoing data that you're going to keep adding to, and you, we, uh, you need to use that, and we'll talk later about a pivot table. Uh, if your pivot table is based on a table, then that means your table is automatically refreshed when you add data at the bottom. Uh, another interesting thing about tables is if you enter a formula in a column, Excel will automatically apply that formula to the entire column. So, and most importantly, again, if you're if you're using a pivot table, then the data automatically added to the table will refresh when you refresh your pivot table. Um, formulas can be written using the table name and the header name, and we'll demonstrate that in a little bit. So in the design ribbon, uh, 
at the far right, you'll see all your different shading options for table styles. Towards the middle, you have some options that allow you to have the filter button. That's a that's a default in Excel, but you can turn that off if you don't want it. Uh, you can turn off the banded rows. There's other options you've got there. And then the next section to the left of that shows export, refresh. There's some other external table, table data. And finally, to the left of that, there it says summarize with a pivot table so you can actually create a pivot table directly from your table you can remove duplicates or you can convert this table to a range which will make it no longer a table and then finally on the farthest left you have the table name uh, this is kind of important because if you want your formulas to be readable to other people and make sense it might make sense to have your table have a name that reflects what the table is about. Uh, one common convention is to name your table TBL underscore and then what it's about, like TBL underscore orders or TBL underscore uh, commissions or whatever. Uh, then you can call that name in formulas and we'll demonstrate that in a little bit. So here's an example of a table. Uh, this table name is table underscore salary, and there's some formulas down there, and you can see uh, sum if table salary, that's our table name, and then a square bracket, hire date, and hire date indicates this column right here. Okay, so table salary, hire date, we're going to sum that. Uh, or we're going to sum if that higher date is greater than or equal to 1 1 2011. And then what we're going to sum is the salary. So that gives me the sum of the annual salaries of the people hired greater than 1 1 of 2011. So notice that there's some that would include these ones down here that were hired 2011 and 2012. We'll show you how this works in the workbook. What's a pivot table? <clears throat> a pivot table is a method to summarize data by rows and columns. It's a very fast method to find sums, averages, counts of any row criteria from any column. So pivot tables can be created from existing data. They do not have to be created from a Excel table. They can just be created from rows and columns of data. However, the first row of your pivot table data must contain header information and none of them can be blank. Um, much like the tables, you, they're created by clicking anywhere within a range of data and clicking insert pivot table or if you're in a table, remember it was summarized with a pivot table. So <clears throat> here's an example. I'm not going to spend time on this very much. Let's kind of flip through this. We're going to add a filter uh, on our pivot table. You'll see how important that is in a minute. Uh, then we're going to talk about some of the newer Excel functions, uh, and we're going to talk about some lookup functions. Um, and then finally, in this file, and we're going to put this one away here for just a minute, are two uh, websites that I use very frequently uh, that are very, very helpful for beginners or advanced users of Excel, both of these. Uh, John Acampora's website uh, is more geared to uh, beginning users. Uh, Minda Tracy's website, My Online Training Hub, uh, she's got lots of, well, I can't spell tutorials, can I? Um, thank you. Um, and she has some free tutorials and some PDF downloads, but she also offers classes, which are excellent. I've taken a couple of the classes. So that being said, we just kind of rushed through this. This is something you can read at your leisure um, and uh, just some further explanations of what we're going to see when we go to the Excel file. So I'm going to stop presenting that and we're just going to go directly to uh, Excel Basics Lesson 2. And the first thing we have here, this is some sample data. This is from a company that I used to work for. 
Uh, you don't need to know who it was or what it was, but well, just put it, suffice it to say we made locks. So over here, these names, these refer to either parts of locks or actual full lock assemblies. Uh, so here we've got a, sale, a sales ID. So this is a sales order, SO, and then it has a number. And you can see here, I have the same number for four lines. That's because this is line one, two, three, and four of the order. There's the customer account number, the customer name, and uh, some various other information in here. So what we're going to do right now, we really want to make this a table. So I'm going to click anywhere in here, and I'm going to go to the home button and see it says format as table. I click on that, and I'm kind of partial to the green, so we're going to do the green table. And this says, Where's the data for your table? Now it is highlighted, and I'm going to warn you right now, there are 370 some lines of this, 367 lines of this data. So it's not, not huge, but it's not small. Uh, and it goes from column A to AE. So A, B, C, D, E, 5 plus 26, that's 31 columns of data. And it says my table has headers. Yep, that's correct. And I'm going to click OK. So now this is now a table. And if I'm by automatically, when I create a table, I'm in the table design ribbon. So I can just come over here. And just for simplicity, I'm just going to call this orders. OK. Now this table name is orders. And there's some interesting things we can do with this. Uh, if I click this one right here and I go insert table columns to the left. Now I've inserted a column. It's still in this table and I'm going to call this city. OK, because if you look here, I have block iron and supply dash Oshkosh. So if you remember, uh, if you were with us last week, we did some text uh, math in our formulas. So what we want to do is we want to find the first character after the dash to the end of that text. So if I say equals, uh, we're going to I'm mid. Mid gives you the middle of a text uh, string. And I want to start, I want to find that dash because it's not in the same place in every text, right? So I'm going to use a Excel function called find. And I'm going to find this oops dash in this starting at the first character and then that's not the first letter of my city name is it there's a space after the dash so i'm going to have to add plus one and now I don't know how long the city name is. Well, there's a good answer for that. I can just say 256. 256 is the is the 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 largest length of a text string, or it's a very large length of a text string. So what it's going to do is it's going to find that city. So here we are, Oshkosh. And notice what happened. It copied that formula all the way down to the bottom of the the table so now i have a city for each one of these characters so now if i wanted to summarize my sales by city uh, that would be pretty easy wouldn't it because I, I now have a field that separates the city from the company from the sales name so let's now that we've got that, 
Uh, we can see how a formula is created. Let's go over here and we'll create one more formula and just show you how it, this is, we're going to right click here and insert table columns to the left. And we're just going to say, this is late. Yes, slash, no, slash, not question mark. Right? So how am I going to get a yes or a no in there? First of all, I need to know if it's been shipped. OK, so right now this is our confirmed ship date. And over here is our required ship date. So I want to know is my confirmed ship date equal to or less than the required ship date? or is it blank or is it greater than? So now I want to know is if it's greater than and if it's today, then it's late, correct? So I'm going to say equals. Now we're going to use a new function, if. And now I'm going to put another function in here or and now i have to separate each function with parentheses uh this is greater than this required ship date that's the first or i'm going to check to or um this is equals blank, which we represent with two, two quotes. And I'm going to step back here because we got to do something a little bit different. Notice that this says con at confirm ship date at required ship date, those are all the table column names. That's why it's able to copy that all the way down. I'm going to stick another one. And and day is greater than the confirmed ship date. Got that in the wrong place, didn't we? OK. These are kind of long formulas. And today is greater than required ship date. So now, if either one of those are true, if either it's the confirmed ship date is greater than the or the the required ship date, or the confirmed ship date is blank and today is greater than the required ship date, then we want that to say. Yes, it's late. And if it's not, if that's neither one of those are true, then the false of that is going to be no. And we press enter. So now, now we have a marker to say how many late shipments do we have? All right. So that kind of summarizes what you can do. You can add. Uh, you can add down here a total row. And this total row will only total those things that look like. And we're going to come over here 
and there is a value. OK, there's our physical inventory. And. There's nothing else that makes any sense. OK, but I don't really want a total row here. That doesn't mean anything to me. So there's a couple other things we can do. We can export this. Uh, to a SharePoint. Uh, if you have SharePoint in your company, then you can export this to SharePoint. Um, we can insert a slicer. I'll show you better on that when we look at the pivot table. Uh, but right now, let's go. There's two ways. We can either click summarize with pivot table to create a pivot table. Or we can right click in this. Go to insert. And pivot table, but let's just go back to the table. This is the easiest way to do it. We're already here, so we're going to summarize with a pivot table. And the table range and I'm going to put this in an existing worksheet. In my pivot table example, and I'm going to drop it down about. Eight rows. OK, so now here's a pivot table. Remember we wanted to see. Let's see how many orders. Um, let's do one other thing here. I got to move this up out, out of the way. Uh, let's see. Customer sales name. Uh, here's all of our people that we sold to and we want to say well how many sales did we make to each one well the only problem with this is remember that there were four lines on that first one let's go back to our sample data here block iron and supply so if we go to block iron and supply it says that there are six but there's really only two orders so how am i going to get that well First of all, I can look in here and see if I do summarize values by, well, right now it's count. And notice this one down here, it says distinct count, but it's grayed out. I can't get that. Well, how am I going to do this? Well, I'm going to tell you right now, we're going to come back out of this. We're going to delete this pivot table and start again. So I'm going to go to my sample table. And now I'm going to insert. Pivot table. And I want to do from now notice this little button down here that says and I could have done it also from the summarize. I just missed it. I want to put it in existing worksheet. Add this data to the data model. Now I'm. I'm not going to go into a long explanation of what the data model is, but the data model allows you to do a pivot table on more than one set of data. If they have common values. Uh, this is. Um, you may have heard somebody talk about power pivot or uh, power query. Those are the things that where you can combine several different spreadsheets that have common things like this sales ID or the customer account number. Uh, and then you can do pivots across all that information. But right now we're going to add this to the data model and we're going to put it back in our pivot table at here. Same place we were before. And click OK. OK. And it's doing it takes a little bit longer when you add it to the data model. But now. Notice that this has orders and that's showing the first table, which is the only table in this data model. But right now we're going to put this sales name down here in the rows. We can just drag it into there. And we're going to hit sales ID because this is. But now. I got to summarize by distinct count. 
now this tells me exactly how many sales orders I had for each company. Uh, we're not duplicating. We're getting a distinct count. And now I can look at this and I can right click here and I can sort this from largest to smallest. OK, now I got my number one customer, right? OK, now we got a lot of customers here. Uh, whoa, we got 66, uh, nine, we got 57 customers here. That's maybe too much to look at because a lot of them are just ones and twos. So I can do a value filter here and say, I want to look at the top 10 by distinct count of sales ID. And now my pivot table shows just the top 10 customers by the number of sales orders that they have given us. OK, so. Now let's say I want to oh, OK, this is nice, but I really want to see this as go up here notice now excel is an object oriented program so now by objects there's this is a pivot table so it's an object so every time you click on an object there's going to be a new ribbon menu up in the top so this is pivot table analyze and now I'm going to insert a slicer. OK, and really what I want is. Who's the guy? That. Uh, I think it's sales ID. Let's just go with sales ID. OK. Oop, wrong one, sorry. Let's delete that. All right, so let's insert that slicer again. Oh, created by, sorry. OK, so this is the salesperson that took the order and created it. So now what this slicer does, um, let's just click A Owens. OK, so the top 10 orders that A. Owens created are these right here. Uh, if I click, let's go, let's go to K. Duncan. There's the top 10 orders that K. Duncan took. And if I just want to see the top 10 orders overall, I can click this clear filter button up here, and there's my top 10 orders overall. So you can see if you were creating a dashboard, uh, oh, let's just do one more thing here. Let's just go to pivot table analyze. And. Uh, where are we? Insert a pivot chart. And OK, this will be OK. Now let's. I'm just going to close this pivot chart feels thing. Now if I pick. J English, that pivot chart changes to the top 10 orders that J English did. If I click K Duncan, the pivot chart changes. So now you could see how this could be useful if you were looking at years or quarters. Um, if those are in your pivot table, then that's an easy way to be able to sort things uh, by year, quarter, person, whatever. So, um, there's a lot more you can do with pivot tables. You can add more than one. So, let's see. I want to open up the field list again. Um, and Item ID, uh, I've got to move this out of the way, sorry. Item ID, I can drag that down here. If I drag it down there, this will give me the count of items. 
And now I don't want the unique count, right? And I'll remove that field. I really don't want that. Oop. Well, let's just get rid of our let's get rid of our filter right now. And we'll get rid of our now. If I put the item ID that says how many distinct items did each company our order? So there were two sales orders, but they ordered a, a total of 18. If we had, let's see, let's go one to one further force. We can add the line amount down here. And that's what each order, the sum of these two orders was $1,314. Um, I could also show values as, show values as percent of the grand total, okay? Show values as no calculation, okay? I could also show summarize values as average. So this is the average of all the items that were ordered. So if I was looking for who ordered the highest value items, I could right click here, sort largest to smallest. And now Kendall Doors and Hardware, they ordered over six items or oh, 85 items with an average amount of $557. So they were ordering some expensive stuff. Uh, whereas Lesser Commercial Doors, they had two sales orders and there were two items and they were an average of $71.69 a piece. So if I was looking at high value customers, I'd be looking more at Kendall Doors and Hardware. You can see how this now comes to begin to analyze that large group of data, the 367 lines of data. Uh, now we can begin to summarize it in to, and remember now we're still dealing with the top 10. Um, so lots of stuff to do with pivot tables. You can create charts. The charts are connected to the pivot tables. So when you create a filter, uh, the filter applies both to the pivot table and to the chart. Um, and that is a good way to represent your data in a dashboard. Um, you can put the pivot table in one, one uh, tab or worksheet and put the charts in a total different worksheet so that all you're showing to your management are just the charts. Uh, that's uh, an in interesting thing to do. Okay, that being said, let's do some think, talk about lookups. Um, so there are, now uh, here we've got uh, six different ways that we can look up data. Uh, why would we want to look up a data? Um, I want to say, uh, who sold this, this sales order? Uh, so remember, and now I can say equals V lookup this in orders. And column index number is orders. And it was who, what would we say it was down here? It was. Created by. If I double click that, that goes in and I add my ending square bracket and then i want an exact match so that's either false or you can type zero because zero in computer language is equal to false one is equal to true oh, it says reference why does it say reference uh probably because you can't do that 
So let's, what column is created by N? Created by is in column AF, which is 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32. So let's see if I change that. Will that fix that? Put in here. Thirty-two. Ah, P. Downey. That's who create who sold that order. Okay. So the V lookup says, "What am I going to look up?" Well, I'm going to look up this. Where am I going to look? Well, I'm going to look in the table orders. And what column am I going to find it in? Well. Now you actually have to put a number in here, 32. And do I want an exact or a near match? Okay, so if you're looking for the closest to that value, then you would put a one. But if you need that value exactly, you put a zero or a false. H lookup. Uh, let's see, I think we have some. Oh, we got to do a lookup or a thing over here for that. H lookup does the opposite. Vertical lookup finds the correct value in the right column and the row that matches the leftmost column that you looked it up in. H lookup does it the other way around. It finds out the row in the column that you've chosen. Okay. Do you match the column that you've chosen? So let's see if we can look at this a little bit. So here we have, uh, where's my age lookup data? So this is age lookup A17, which is A17. Data four. Hmm. How do I find out what data for is? Well, I could do control find control F and type in data for. And it can't find it. It's because we haven't said what it is yet. OK, so let's call this. And if I want to name a range, I can just come right up here and say data four. Oh, data four is already. Aha, uh -huh. OK. So. H lookup A18. So A18 is John. So I'm going to look up John, which is the first column in data four. And. Uh, e16. So what's E dollar sign 16? Well, E16 is. Six. So I'm looking up in. I want to find in column John the six value. So what's the six value? Well, six is Saturday, so it should be 10. But it's eight. All right. At any rate, H lookup. I, I don't use very often. You can use it. Uh, choose is used even less often. Uh, you can choose from a list. So this is choosing from a list. Choose this number from M24, M25, M26. Well, what in the world is that? Well, M24, M25, M26 is this list of days. So if I choose six from those days, well, that's Friday. Okay. Uh, why is that Friday? 
because that's certainly not one, two, three, four, five. That looks like that's the fifth one. So what's M24? Oh, because M24 is the day. So now we have to change this. Uh, if I, yeah, well, forget that. Okay, you see what I did wrong here? If this started with M25, 26, 27, sixth day would come up as Saturday. And that's because we've put Monday as the first day. Okay. Index and match. So here's where we're going to find where our, our um, 12 and 4, OK, equals index. Look at the 12th row and the fourth column of the table orders. So our array is orders. 12th row, fourth column. I'll put commas between them, John. 12th row, fourth column, and that's New Orleans, okay? Which is what this formula is here. Now, the way I showed what that formula was, I used this function, formula text, and pointed back to this formula, and it tells me, now, that says sample data. And that reason it says sample data is because I created that formula before I created this table. So now I want to find out this. I want to find out what sales order is related to Horner commercial sales. So now I don't necessarily, I'm not looking up where the left, I'm looking up. Let's go back to this. I'm going to look up what this name is or what this sales ID is based on the name. So I can't use VLOOKUP because VLOOKUP always starts with the leftmost value and looks to the right. And HLOOKUP always starts with the topmost value and looks down. So now we have a new formula or a new function called XLOOKUP. And XLOOKUP allows you to tell you where you want to look, what you want to use as your criteria for looking, and what you're going to return. So here, and let's just look at this formula, equals formula text. XLOOKUP, sample data, and we could redo this equals x lookup. This value in orders sales name and I want to return from orders sales ID And now I can say if it's not found, I can actually put in the word not found in quotes. But it found it, okay? Um, likewise, we could look this up in the same way. Uh, this, is X, this is a VLOOKUP because we're starting with the leftmost column. So we can do a VLOOKUP here. XLOOKUP is really important if you're going to use it to find something to the left of what you're looking for or to the right. It'll work either way. Um, let's stop. I want to make these things work. And the way that I'm going to make these things work is we're going to create some named ranges here. 
but I want to create these named ranges all at once. So in my formula bar, I want to create from selection the names in the top row. So now I have a named range. This is John. Look up here, see? And this is Larry. So now, indirect equals the sum of John and the sum of Larry and the sum of Bob and the sum of Jane. And indirect says, I'm going to use not John, but the value of John as a range to look at that data, OK? So let's go right now, let's go over to some spell functions. All right, we have already said we're going to look up this, but it only returned one sales order. What if I want to see all the sales orders? So we have this new function in XL 365 called filter. Orders. Uh, sales name. Orders. Sales name equals no 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 sorry equal orders sales id and include if orders sales name equals C2. And close parentheses. Ah, oh, look at all that. Well, it, the only problem is, is look, I've got S457 twice and 459 twice and then 457 again. So how am I going to get this fixed? Well, there's another function called unique. And I'm going to wrap that entire fun formula in the word unique. And now, now I have a unique list of all the unique sales orders for Horner Commercial Sales in Somerset. Okay. So we use these two, filter and unique. Uh, sort will allow you to sort a list in another place. So let's now there's an interesting thing about these these spill functions. If I click down here, notice it's grayed out and says unique filter. That means I cannot do any math or any function on that value as it sits right there. If I wanted to now do some manipulations with those, I would have to copy that list and paste it as values. And then I would have that. But right now, if I'm just looking for, well, what are the unique order numbers? OK, well, there they are. Uh, now, if I want to use those to look something up, then I would have to turn them into actual values. Same thing here uh, equals sort. Um, sorts of range or array. And we're just going to put this range table salary three. And I want to sort by salary. And my sort order is, let's put it in descending and close. Ah, why didn't it like that? How about if we just make this a a 
let's convert this to a range. Now, equals sort by minus one. Ah, there we go. It doesn't like doing it with tables. It'll do it with a range. Okay. So now notice my original data is intact. I didn't change my original data. So if I wanted to keep this in order of the uh, higher date, but I still wanted to see where, what were the top five salaries? Then now I've got this data over here. And again, if I click here, notice it says equal sort by, it doesn't say 115, 2010. So if I wanted to turn this into data that I can manipulate, then I just hit control C and paste as values. And now this is 94060, this is 31010, and I can do something with that. Okay, we have covered a bunch. Uh, so I'm going to stop at this point. Yes. Uh, so somebody says if you could give only one piece of advice to someone looking to become an expert in Excel, what would it be? That's a good question. Those two websites that I have in the PowerPoint that you're going to receive, uh, Minda Tracy's particularly is the that's the my online training hub. Uh, I have used that for 10 years and they have some really fine tutorials. Uh, they have a class on how to create dashboards. They have a class on the, they even go up into uh, teaching you about visual basic. Um, they're, and their classes are reasonable. Um, I think uh, the dashboard class was like $60 or something. So, you know, it's not like super expensive. Um, if I was looking to become an expert in Excel, I, that'd be a good place to start. And what's uh, the website again? I can post in this chat. Uh, MyOnlineTrainingHub.com. Thanks for the question, Hope. That was a great question. Yeah, yeah. That's it. Um, she's in Australia. Uh, she is an Excel MVP. That means uh, MVPs are people who are recognized by Microsoft as being, you know, super users. Nice. Um, so uh, there's there's a couple of other ones. Um, if you if you want to learn VBA, uh, there's some sites to do that. One of the better ones is uh, Excel for freelancers. Um, they, he goes through how you create an application from scratch. Uh, how do you create a, a, a user friendly invoice from scratch? Uh, how do you create a calendar that you just drag and drop from scratch? And he goes through all the VBA and how it's done. So he's a pretty good place. That's Excel for freelancers. Excel for freelancers. 